Welcome to APCUG's Saturday Safari, where we get on the big trucks and we go through the back roads and through the trees and through the valleys and learn a lot more about technology. This morning, we are going to finish up our series on security. We've been doing that for the last number of weeks, and we're very excited to have with us again, Bob Gasticha, who uh, is from New Mexico. And I get to be able to say he is a long distant member of my computer club in Ohio. And uh, Bob has been touring the country over the last number of years, but uh, recently due to what we all know has been here, has been limited to doing online. He's hoping that this is going to be a year when 23, he's back on the road, coming to visit your groups and do presentations. Uh, he's been here every year. We always appreciate his efforts to teach us new things and important things about security. So I'm going to turn things over to Bob and say, Bob, help us with the cybersecurity. Good morning. It is nice to see so many people attending. You'll have to bear with me a bit. I am having some problems with my voice. It's been going on for almost a week. Let's hope it stays around for the whole presentation. Topic for this morning is cyber safety in the digital age. And this presentation points out the dangers and offers suggestions that will aid in keeping you secure in the digital era. Using the right programs and apps can help keep you safe, secure, and shrink your digital footprint. Using free programs and apps whenever possible to accomplish this goal is a bonus. And this presentation includes information on many recommended free programs. Join me as I guide you in the right direction to enhance your cyber safety in the digital age. I asked my grandmother to fetch me a newspaper. I'm sorry, I asked my granddaughter to fetch me a newspaper. She laughed and said, Grandpa, you're just too old. Just use my phone. So I did. I slammed the phone against the wall and killed that big hairy spider. I guarantee you the next time she'll fetch me a newspaper. The way we live, work, and play has changed dramatically over the course of the past 50 years. The nine to five economies of years past have been replaced with globally integrated 24 seven service offerings. Consumers in the digital age have access to a host of services and products that would have previously been considered available only in the realm of science fiction. Here are the 10 most dangerous malware and security threats we face in 2022. 10 most dangerous malware and security threats for 2022. Clop ransomware works by encrypting your files and asking you to pay a certain ransom amount to have them decrypted. It's one of the most dangerous and feared ransomware variants, and it mostly targets Windows users. Fake updates is a new strategy that cyber criminals are using to trick users into hacking themselves. They will send fake emails asking you to install an operating system update. Zeus game over. This virus mainly targets finances and can easily access your bank account details and get away with all the available funds. News malware attacks. This has become a common trick where hackers use trending news to target unsuspecting people. Social engineering. Cyber criminals are now shifting from computers to humans as they find them weaker and easier to trick. They are using deception to lure them into giving out personal details. AI attacks. Hackers are taking advantage of artificial intelligence technology to create links to help them to get into any system. Cryptojacking. This virus is specifically designed to help hackers mine cryptocurrencies. Freeware. 
Over 600 million cell phone users have already downloaded this malware without realizing its potential harm. RAAS, Ransomware as a Service. This is one of the most common and popular security threats of the year. IoT Device Attacks. Hackers target Internet of Things devices, which could be anything from smart devices to your doorbell. Most of these devices do not contain extra security measures, making it easier to manipulate to access data, which the criminals can then use to access your accounts. Currently, phishing is rampant. Phishing attacks are more common than ever before, and they regularly lead to fraud, identity theft, and corporate data breaches. But what is phishing? And how can you avoid it? Please watch the next video for answers to these questions. The rise in remote work, online shopping, and incompetent FCC leadership creates a perfect storm for scammers. Phishing attacks are more common than ever before, and they regularly lead to fraud, identity theft, and corporate data breaches. But what is phishing, and how can you avoid it? Phishing is actually a catch-all term for a variety of cybercrimes. But in its most basic form, phishing, pronounced phishing, is a scam in which a victim is tricked into sharing sensitive information or download ransomware. The majority of phishing schemes occur via email or SMS text messages, and they tend to follow a simple formula. Scammers will impersonate someone trustworthy, such as Amazon, a police department, or an employer, and tell you about a problem that requires immediate attention. Usually, the problem can only be solved by sharing credit card details, opening a malicious file, or typing your login data into a fake website. Phishing schemes can be very sophisticated. Scammers may learn details about your employment, subscriptions, family, or location before attempting a phishing attack. If you order shoes from a website that's been hacked, for example, a scammer may send you an email asking to verify the purchase of your login details. And if you're of retirement age, a scammer may impersonate a young family member to beg for bail money. To be perfectly clear, phishing schemes aren't just directed toward individuals. According to a recent Proofpoint report, over 55% of businesses fell victim to a phishing attack in 2020. More than half of these companies ended up with ransomware on their systems. And unfortunately, several of these phishing attacks led to a data breach which can expose customer information to hackers. Governments are also a huge target for phishing schemes. The CSIS maintains a long list of successful cyber attacks against government organizations, and many of these attacks were enabled by phishing. You need to realize that regular people are the first and only line of defense in a phishing attack. But Proofpoint's data shows that over half of all full-time workers know nothing about phishing. Clearly, businesses and governments aren't educating people on this topic, which is why it's so important to sit down and learn about it yourself. On the next several slides, we'll talk about the most common forms of phishing. First is email phishing. This is the most common form of phishing. A scammer impersonates a popular website or figure like Amazon or a politician in an attempt to steal your information or trick you into downloading ransomware. They may even create a custom domain name to make their email address look official. Spear phishing. Scammers who want to hit a specific target will resort to spear phishing. They gather information on their victim before impersonating a trustworthy person, business, or automated message. Clone phishing. Most phishing emails are sent to victims at random. 
but in some cases, a scammer will send you a duplicate version of a real email. If you receive an order confirmation, for example, a hacker may send a copycat order information containing malicious links or attachments. Pop-up phishing. Pop-ups are still a common vector for scams and malware. Modern pop-up phishing attacks usually take advantage of a browser's notification settings to send you antivirus warnings. Angler phishing. The world of social media lets scammers angler fish for victims. Essentially, scammers will impersonate a public figure or company on social media. Someone may impersonate a YouTube creator to share scammy sweepstakes links in a video's comments, for example. Whaling. When a phishing attack is aimed toward an important person, such as a CEO, it's called whaling. These targets are often wealthy, easy to blackmail, or have access to a corporation's back end. Smishing and vishing. These terms describe phishing through an SMS text message or phone call. Most of the spam messages or robocalls you receive are forms of smishing or vishing. Here are some tips on how to avoid phishing scams. Due to the rise in remote work, phishing is more popular than ever, and we expect it to remain a huge problem for individuals, corporations, and governments. Phishing scams can be quite sophisticated, so even if you're computer literate or use an antivirus software, you need to keep your eyes peeled. Scrutinize every email or SMS message that hits your inbox. If someone sends you a URL or a file, don't open it unless you can verify the source. And I'm not just telling you to look at the sender's email address or phone number. Try to contact the organization or person who supposedly wrote that email to verify its authenticity. There are some things you should never send through an email or text message. If someone asks you to type out your social security number or credit card info in an email or text, ignore them. Your bank won't ask for this stuff on such an insecure platform, and neither will the IRS or any other reputable company. Some scammers are bold enough to fish through phone calls. They may even impersonate the police, the bank, or your employer. If an unknown number calls and asks for money or sensitive information, hang up. You can always call back using an official phone number from the organization's website. To reduce your chances of being fished, set up spam filters in your email client. You may also want to install an antivirus software and disable website notifications in your browser. Since phishing attacks are so common, I suggest taking some preventative measures to reduce their impact. Use a password manager to create unique passwords for every account and enable two-factor authentication on all websites, as it will lock out scammers even if they have your password. You can also activate a fraud alert through a credit bureau to prevent new lines of credit from opening under your name. I hope this makes you a little more cognizant of all the different types of phishing scams that are out there. Stay One way to lessen our exposure to these malware and security threats is to be cognizant of our digital footprint. The rise in Know what your digital trail says about you before it causes you problems. And if you're active online, you have a digital footprint. Everyone does. Every comment made on social media, every news article shared, and every purchase made online contributes to a person's data trail. Your data trail reveals a detailed picture of who you are and what you like. And this data is valuable and often monetized by free services and apps like Facebook, Google, and Twitter. When you're logged in, you're being tracked across every page you visit. And there are costs and benefits 
to go with your data trail. For example, when sites know what you like, you see more relevant ads and products and services that appeal to you. When you allow cookies from websites, they remember what you've seen or clicked on and can make your visit faster and less repetitive. Remember that some things can never be erased. Elements of your digital footprint can be searched or shared by others. And something that you thought you were sending as a private message can easily be shared with a larger audience, which can be embarrassing or hurtful. Worst of all, once it's on the internet, it's there forever. Just ask ex-Congressman Anthony Weiner. Remember, the internet never forgets. And here's how all of this works. When you visit a website, it collects information about you by installing cookies on your phone, tablet, or computer browser. This information includes your IP address, which is a unique address that identifies a device on the internet or a local network. It also records your login details and anything else about you that you reveal or gets posted about you. When you choose to post on social media platforms, sign up for newsletters or text alerts, or agree to install cookies by clicking accept on the cookie consent banner on a website, you are leaving a data record of your activity. Your digital footprint is basically your online reputation. It can be helpful or harmful. What you say online can impact your everyday life. And managing your data trail isn't only about privacy and data security. Employers, schools, and law enforcement could use your online activity on social media to make character assessments. So it's important to keep your online identity positive. Imagine what someone might think about you based on your actions online. Additionally, you may not always be aware of the digital footprint you're creating. Examples of hidden data collection include websites that install cookies without telling you, mobile apps and sites that use geolocation to determine your location, and social media ads or news sites that profile you based on your likes, shares, and comments to serve you advertisements that relate to your interests. Now that you're aware of some of the ways you're leaving a data trail online, the next step is to keep your reputation positive and your data secure. Already know that everything you share and do online is permanent and can either help or hurt your reputation. While some things like viral videos or mega memes can never be fully scrubbed from the web, most places that host your personal information can be adjusted. And here are nine tips for a cleaner digital footprint. Start by searching for your own name. Put yourself in the shoes of those who want to learn more about you whether they are recruiters, hackers, or vengeful exes. It's important for you to know what they'll find by simply searching for you. Use multiple search sites since they can yield different results. And if you have a username, also search for it. I still miss my ex-husband, but my aim is improvement. Scrub your public data. Real estate websites and whitepages.com may have more information about you than you might want available to the public. We're talking about personal information like your phone number, age, and even your home address. You can contact those websites and have that information removed. Audit your accounts. During your name search, you may have come across old social media accounts, posts with insensitive, outdated jokes or embarrassing blog posts in which you overshare too much of your personal life. Culture changes and you deserve to change for the better with it. Dig up everything you've ever posted and evaluate it with fresh eyes. Archive and delete. After evaluating your posts for, risk, for privacy risks and negative content, 
it's time to edit and delete. Don't send any accounts that aren't doing any good for your reputation, both now and in the future. Remember, some content can never be fully deleted. Even if you think it's private, law enforcement and hackers can still dig up things you don't want shared. It's therefore much better to never share negative posts in the first place. Remember again that the internet is permanent. Adjust privacy settings. Review your account settings in your browser and mobile apps. Minimize the exposure of your personal data by limiting what people can see. This includes your photos, posts, location, and personal information, like your address or birth date. Clear your browser history. Even if you believe every website you've ever visited has been safe for your reputation, it's a good idea to clear your browsing history on a regular basis. Using the shortcut key combo of control shift delete gets rid of that information on almost all the browsers. Better internet privacy prevents history sniffing and helps your browser run faster. Clean up your computer. Temporary files, duplicate files, files you thought you trashed, and low-res photos can all slow down your computer and create a security risk. Use CCleaner for both Mac and PC to clean up your computer and get it running faster again. You should also clean up your phone. The more you use your phone, the more junk it collects. Old text messages, cookies, images, and browser history data take up a lot of storage. If the data doesn't exist, it can't be used against you. Plus, your phone will perform better. Clean things up every few weeks. And yes, you can also use CCleaner to clean up your iPhone and Android phone. Be mindful of others. You can create a bad online reputation without writing a single word. Think before you share or repost negative content. When you repost, their words and ideas become yours. Be especially careful with humor around sensitive topics, including race, religion, and politics. And when you post original photos, remember that some people have different levels of online privacy than you. Ask permission before you tag others online or ask your friends to tag themselves. Keep in mind that blowing out someone else's candle won't make yours shine any brighter. Remember, it's better to be proactive about being positive. Don't post anything that you don't want to come back and haunt you in the future. Again, the internet never forgets. Also, keeping your data trail clean isn't only about your reputation. The junk you allow your devices to collect puts your internet privacy and security at risk. Now that we've covered some of the dangers facing us in the digital age, let me share some tools that will make the job of staying safe a bit easier. We'll start with CCleaner. And CCleaner is a small effective utility for computers running Microsoft Windows, Mac, and Android that helps clean out the junk that accumulates over time, such as temporary files, broken shortcuts, and other problems. CCleaner protects your privacy. It cleans your browsing history and temporary internet files, allowing you to be a more confident internet user and less susceptible to identity theft. I recommend that you use the portable version. You can install that on a flash drive and then take it from one system to the next. Program and app security. Follow these tips. Only download from sites and app stores you trust. Only deal with companies you trust. Never download illegal software. And never use a password generator or a crack to bypass paying for a product. Scan your downloads from malware. You might want to test them in the sandbox. And if you really aren't sure about that program, back up your system before you install. 
That way, if something goes wrong, you've got a way of going back. Recuva. For both Windows and Mac, it helps you to recover deleted files quickly and easily. Have you ever accidentally deleted an important file? Maybe you've lost some files after a computer crash? No problem. If you have Recuva, it helps you to recover files from your window and Mac computer, recycle bin, digital camera card, or MP3 player. As I said, this is available for both Windows and Mac. You should also get in a habit on a regular basis to back up your system. If you have an image backup and something happens to your system, whether it's because of hardware failure or an infection, within a short amount of time, you can restore everything back to just the way it was when you created that last image backup. I'm on a Windows system and I use something that's been around since Windows 7. It's called Backup and Restore Windows 7, and it works in the very latest version of Windows 11. I know because that's what I still use every week to create an image backup. If you don't have a backup, you'll lose all your personal information. You can always reinstall the programs and apps, but if there's no backup, your personal information, your files, documents, emails, photos, all the important stuff. That's what's at risk. You should also remember that doing a backup should be done before you have a problem, because once the problem starts, at that time, it's too late. You should also, on a regular basis, update your programs and apps. And the program I depend on for that is called Peace, patch my PC home updater. I think it's a perfect program and it should be on everybody's computer. And the next video will tell you why I think that way. Are you sick and tired of those annoying pop-ups reminding you to update some software program on your PC? Let Patch My PC help with the cumbersome task of manually updating your software. We can automatically update over 300 applications. It's critical to keep third-party applications up to date because hackers target vulnerabilities and outdated software in order to compromise your PC. Need to install a new application that's not currently installed? Just select the app and then it's a single click to start the installation. Are you an IT pro? Easily create a baseline of applications you want to install automatically on multiple PCs. You can even configure Patch My PC to run on a schedule so you never have to worry about it. Patch My PC, a little program that does a lot. It's simple, easy to use, and best of all, it's free. It's also important to make sure that your internet runs smoothly. And the program I depend on for that is called Complete Internet Repair. Whenever I have a problem with my internet access, this is my go-to tool. Provided the problem isn't with your internet service provider, you run the tool, check the top five boxes, and let it do its work. You do have to restart the system in order for those repairs to take effect. I personally have never ever not had my internet access back after using this tool. Again, if the problem is between you and your internet service provider, no tool will help. You will have to contact them to solve the problem. For everything else, this has always worked for me. You also need to learn the ins and outs of your system, both hardware and software. And an excellent program for that is called Specky. You might notice it's made from the same people that make CCleaner, and both of them are part of Avast. The very first program that should be installed on any computer before you install anything else, install on Checky. Installers often try to sneak additional programs as a natural part of the insta installation. Unchecky warns you when you try to accept a potentially unwanted offer which makes it less likely to be accepted accidentally. 
Most people use a default install, which means whatever the company wants to install in your system is what they'll install. If unchecky runs in the background, that won't happen because they'll let you know when some garbage is about to be installed. I personally always use a custom install. That way I get to choose what gets installed and what doesn't get installed. Unchecky does that even if you use the automatic installation. Passwords need to be long and strong and you should be using a different password for everything that requires a password. As it states here, passwords are like underpants. Change them often, keep them private, and never share them. I've listed some of the common and popular password managers. I personally have used LastPass for many years. And about eight months ago, I added Bitwarden to the mix. Unlike an antivirus, you can have more than one password manager on your system. My reasoning is very simple. If LastPass decides to quit tomorrow, then Bitwarden has my back and my passwords. And vice versa, if Bitwarden quits, I still have LastPass with my back and my passwords. Two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Two-factor is an extra layer of security used to make sure that people trying to gain access to an online account are who they say they are. First, the user will enter the username and password, and then instead of immediately gaining access, they'll be required to provide another piece of information. The second factor could come from one of several categories. Usually, it comes from either a smartphone, an email address, or some other biometric device. It basically means that username and password alone won't get a hacker to your account and unlikely that they will at the same time also have stolen your cell phone. And if they don't have that second piece of information, which is sent to your cell phone, they'll never get to your account. Especially important if the account involves money. VPN, virtual private network. Staying safe when connecting via a public network. And a public network is any network where you don't control its security. The next video will show you how a VPN securely encrypts your connection and thereby keeps you safe. So how does a VPN securely encrypt your connection? If you're shopping for a VPN, you'll have seen how services boast about having the best encryption and how important it is that you secure your connection using cryptography. But how do VPNs encrypt your connection and are there different types of encryptions to choose from? VPN tunnels. To explain how VPNs encrypt your connection, we need to first look at so-called VPN tunnels. Normally, when you visit a site, you connect to a server operated by your internet service provider, which redirects you to the site you want to visit. When you use a VPN, you're rerouting your connection. Instead of going from the internet service provider's server to the site, you first go through a server operated by your VPN provider. This gives you a new IP address, which comes in handy for a number of reasons. But the VPN also performs another neat trick. It encrypts the connection from your ISP to the VPN server in what's called a tunnel. A VPN tunnel is an encrypted connection that prevents anybody else, including your ISP and the site you're visiting, from tracking you. The ISP won't be able to see the websites you're visiting and the websites you're visiting won't be able to see your real IP address. Tunnel is a great name for it as it works like it would if you were driving down the road. While in the open, anybody can see what you're doing and where you're going. But once you enter a tunnel, your whereabouts are anybody's guess. Of course, VPN tunnels 
aren't made with bricks and mortar. Instead, they're created by so-called VPN protocols, which we'll look at next. To establish a VPN tunnel, you need to use a VPN protocol, which is a piece of software that determines how a VPN talks to other machines on the network. A protocol can do a lot of different things, but most importantly, it contains information about what encryption is used and how traffic is routed through the server. As such, VPN protocols are very important as they can determine the speed and security of your connection. There are a lot of different VPN protocols to choose from, but the best all-around one is called OpenVPN. It generally offers decent speeds while staying secure, which is, of course, the main reason why many people get a VPN. VPN protocols generally will give you the option of what type of encryption will be used in your tunnel, which is what we'll look at next. Encryption. VPNs keep your connection secure through encryption, which is a way to make messages unreadable by scrambling them to nonsense. To unscramble them, you need a key, a piece of code that serves as the lock for the scramble. This key, usually a mathematical formula, called an algorithm, is also known as a cipher. How it works with VPNs is that your connection is encrypted when you connect to the internet, the start of the tunnel, so to speak. Once it arrives at the other end, at the VPN's server, it gets decrypted and sent along to the site you're visiting. The result is that the site sees the VPN's server IP address and your ISP sees a stream of scrambled information. There are different types of encryption. To ensure that information stays safe, you need to use a good type of encryption, and not all are created equal. As a result, many VPN providers will boast that they offer military-grade encryption, which is just a fancy way of saying that they use the same encryption algorithm as the military. The most used encryption is the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES for short, which comes in several variants. Each variant uses a different number of bits to encrypt its key. Longer offers more security. The most secure is AES-256, which means it uses a key of 256 bits and would take your laptop until the heat death of the universe to crack. In other words, it's pretty darn secure. Protecting the key. Well, it's secure except for one issue. The key itself also needs to be protected. To do so, it's usually secured using TLS, or Transport Layer Security. This technology is common across the internet and used in all kinds of technology. From cloud storage to HTTPS, a protocol you're using right now to read this web page. We know it's all very involved, but the upshot is that no intruder can crack the ciphers of a VPN tunnel. If you're using a VPN and they take security seriously, there's almost no way in which your connection can be cracked from the outside. I personally use and can highly recommend Avast's Secure Line. Just follow that link to reach the product. Avast's newest product is called Avast One, and the free version is called Avast One Essential. Essential protection for your life today. It helps to block viruses and malware with an advanced antivirus, keeps intruders out with a built-in firewall, helps you to get extra privacy when you browse, bank, or shop, secures, secures your Wi-Fi connection with a built-in VPN, and in the free version, it encrypts five gigabytes per week which is a whole lot more than most people will ever need. 
helps you to find compromised passwords and helps speed up your PC. This product is available for Windows, Mac, Android, iPhones, iPads, almost everything that connects to the internet. It also offers an excellent Chromium-based browser. They call it their secure browser, specifically designed to keep you safe when you do your banking and shopping. When you're in banking mode, you're totally isolated from everything else. No one can get to anything that you're doing while you're in banking mode. This is available for Windows, Mac, Android, and iOS. Browse the web faster and safer with a vast secure browser. Your browser is not as private as you think. Hackers, trackers, and ISPs are out to steal your data. But with a vast secure browser, you're protected. Stay safe on public Wi-Fi and unlock the internet with built-in VPN. Automatically block creepy ads that follow you around and slow you down. Create custom and security privacy settings. Then securely sync your data across multiple devices. With powerful encryption to protect your IP address, bookmarks, history, downloads, and online activity, it's all locked behind your PIN code or fingerprint to keep your data safe from prying eyes. For private browsing that's actually private, make the switch to a vast secure browser. Download free today. My presentations are never done until we have a little fun. Don't worry, when you get old, I'll feed you carrots too. Here's a neat trick. When electricity is out, this is how you charge your phone. Answering the phone, Sheriff's Department Fraud Division sure has slowed down the telemarketer calls. If you live out in the country, you've probably seen this truck quite often. And it's nice when it says yesterday's meals on wheels. It certainly sounds better than to say a load of crap going down the road. When a woman says what, it's not because she didn't hear you. She's just giving you a chance to change what you said. I'm trying to eat healthy, and here's my version of a salad with bacon bits. And since we're on a health food kick, here's something I have in my refrigerator because I get the munchies in the evening. You're not hungry. You're just bored. Shut the damn door. This is called some life-saving advice. Since I started packaging my trash like this, my neighbors actually respect me. They say good morning with a smile and keep the music volume really low. Give it a try. It works. I'm the most respected person in the whole neighborhood. Here's something highly recommended for everyone over 50. And this morning's exercises. Over to the left and over and over to the right and stretch those limbs and then walk tall away. Even I have no problems doing that exercise. I started doing presentations back in 2010, and I have a nice arrangement with Avast. They pay for all of my expenses from the second I leave home until I get back. And that worked out really well until March of 2019. Since then, I haven't left my home at all. 
So Avast has been getting a bargain. I'm itching to get back out on the road. And I think my wife might also be itching for me to get back out on the road. My presentation is always designed for the average computer user, not the geek. And if you know of any other clubs that would benefit from a presentation, have them contact me and I'll be happy to arrange a program for them. Usually my voice is a lot better than this. There's never a charge to the club or its members for my services. That's where Avast comes in. If you're interested in some of the other things that I'm involved in, just follow the link listed at the bottom. This link will get you access to almost everything we've talked about this afternoon. If not, it'll be part of the information that's forwarded after the presentation. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks very much, Bob. I'm going to turn things over to Judy. And I have a couple of questions. What is a sandbox? Sandbox. The best way to explain a sandbox is if we go back to our childhood, we went out and played in a sandbox. And when we got all finished, somebody came along with a rake and it was back to like we were never in there in the first place. A sandbox is a special place set aside on your system that doesn't affect the operating system. So you can do almost anything you want in a sandbox. And if it's something bad, it's not going to happen to your operating system. It's a place to experiment, a place where you can be safe and still be on your computer because it never really makes it to your computer. Cool. And my other question is, which VPN provider is safer to use? Some VPN providers may collect IP addresses and provide sale to and may sell them to businesses for marketing. Be using a VPN that keeps no records, period. If it doesn't keep anything, it also can't be forced to turn anything over. Okay, so your Whoever you use, they should not be collecting anything. A uh, comment on that is uh, somebody said that he's finding that uh, websites, banks, et cetera, will not let him come in with or her with a VPN uh, active. It's a possibility because your bank expects you to be at your home address or within your town. And if your VPN uses an IP address that's in some different state or some different country, the bank assumes somebody got a hold of your credit card. And of course, they're not going to admit you. When I was still traveling, I always filed travel uh, information with my bank. And I told them this month I'll be in Florida. And then I used the VP address that's in Florida. And I never had any problems using the VPN. The first, first time I used my VPN, I thought, I'll be in Germany. And I had to deal with Discover Card. And she wouldn't give me the time of day. But I kept saying, but I'm just sitting right here. And that was why. So I learned my lesson. I now use uh, California. Works better for me. And those are the two questions I have. Thank you so much. It, as usual. You learn a little bit here, you learn a little bit there, and you get to laugh a lot. And I know you like us to unmute, but I was laughing hysterically over here in SoCal. What can I tell you? And I've heard them all before. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. <laughs> over to you, John Kennedy. I'd like to thank Bob for sharing with us again this year. And uh, we'll be looking forward to his new and improved uh, cybersecurity and protection program for 2023.